Here's a common scenario we're hearing about from pre-meds and other healthcare fields. It goes like this. I had a great volunteer community service gig lined up for the spring and summer, but it was canceled due to COVID. What can I do to get this kind of experience and apply effectively? Our guest today is not only going to share his path to Harvard Medical School, but also provide the answer to that question. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Welcome to the 370th episode of Mission Straight Talk. Thank you so much for tuning in. Are you ready to apply to your dream medical school? Are you competitive at that school? Accept its med school admissions calculator can give you a quick reality check. Just go to accepted.com slash 370 quiz, complete the quiz, and you'll not only get the assessment, but tips on how to improve your chances of acceptance. Plus, it's all free. Again, use the calculator at accepted.com slash 370quiz to obtain your free assessment. Our guest today is Jalen Benson. Jalen earned his bachelor's in biology at Dartmouth College in 2017. Then for two years, he experienced life without winters as a research assistant at Stanford University. He started his med school education last August at Harvard Medical, and then COVID hit, hit rather, and Jensen decided to do something in response. He founded the National Student Response Network, or NSRN, which we're going to learn much more about in this episode. Jalen, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Good morning, and thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Now, can you tell us a little bit about your background outside of medicine, where you grew up, what do you like to do for fun, things like that? Yeah, gladly. So I'm from the town of Pensacola, Florida. It's in the panhandle of Florida between Tallahassee and New Orleans, so way, way at the far western end. Um, nice and warm, nice sunny beaches. Um, so growing up in Pensacola, I really could never be still. I love playing soccer and I was always doing that and running around doing a million and one things from history to working at to working at the beach. And my family was mostly me, my younger brother, and then my mom. Well, it sounds like you still like to be busy. Yeah, that's doing definitely, all kinds of daily, right? definitely, definitely okay, say that. Great. And then going to college, I got involved more in the outdoors and now I love hiking and skiing and the whole nine yards. All the things you get into going to New Hampshire when you see snow for the first time, I've learned <laughs> what, what am I doing. Um, yeah, I was thinking about that actually from, from Pensacola, Florida to New Hampshire. That's, that's, a, that's a weather shock for sure, a culture shock. <laughs> oh yeah, to put it lightly, and my parents didn't, didn't go to college, so there was no warning of what to do or how to do this. It was, all right, it sounds great. I visited, it looks good to me. I didn't think about what snow was. I'd seen it before, but <laughs> I adjusted and I guess I learned to love it and I learned to play ice hockey and ski and go hiking. My parents still don't know quite how that happened, but here we are. <laughs> All right. And, and the Dartmouth campus is gorgeous. The surrounding yes. area is absolutely beautiful. Now, when did you decide to become a doctor? Um, so I'll say that it's, it's funny. I spent most of my life trying to avoid medicine. My mom is an MRI tech, um, and she raised us probably by herself. So I met a lot of weekends. When she was on call, we were on call, going to the hospital and sitting in waiting rooms. And I was like, this is, I didn't want to do this. I thought I was going to do law. And then as I got older, I, like, I fell more in love with science. And kind of what struck me about medicine was the idea of the trust the patient gives you in the story. When you talk to a patient, I was like, oh, my leg is broken and fix it, because I can fix problems as like an architect or a lawyer or anything else. But when they say the leg is broken, they say it's broken and that's really important because my daughter has a recital next week and my wife is sick, so I need to be able to go to the recital on her behalf. And so how do we make sure that we're doing that? And so the trust you get from patients and those pieces of stories you get, that's what really made me know that this is, this is what, what I want to do. You help people out, get a piece of their story, and then they leave better for having seen you, hopefully. Right. Were you considering a career in research when you went to Stanford and did those two years, or were you always convinced that the clinical path was the path for you? I definitely toy with some ideas. I knew that clinical path was always part of the role that I wanted to do, but I done work that I loved in undergrad in peds cancer research and peds cancer surgery. And I think for myself, I thought, am I gonna be MD? Am I gonna be MD, PhD? What does research mean? And so I took that year actually to do two things. So I was doing, my day job was research um, in thoracic surgery at Stanford, which I loved and I had a phenomenal team. 
Actually, in the evenings, I volunteered at a needle exchange where I was a Narcan counselor. And so it was a good chance to see kind of, it was a great juxtaposition. The mornings were robotic thoracic surgery and the evenings were giving out band-aids and clean supplies on the streets of San Francisco. And it was kind of that experience that let me know that I'm always gonna wanna treat a patient and cure everyone behind them. But what I learned from that is I need to start by getting the MD. I wish it evolves what I do a PhD during residency, maybe will I get my MPH, probably. Um, but for now I know that the MD is what is really important to me and that's what I'm pursuing. Okay, great. So you, you basically prioritized. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. What was the hardest part of the med school application process for you? I think for me, the hardest part was the self-doubt. I never thought I would get into medical school. Like going to Dartmouth, I was not fit Phi Beta Kappa. I did not do well. Actually, my sophomore fall, I made a D in organic chemistry. And so I really thought that it was over for me. Um, and my, my grades got better and I had a reason why and I addressed that in application. I told them what happened and there were things in my family and I laid it out very honestly, but I didn't think I was gonna get in. And so the self-doubt was terrifying. And the first news that I got when I was applying to medical school, it was a school that I, I had a nice range and it was, it was um, actually, it was one of my state schools, the University of Central Florida. And they were a newer medical school. I thought I may have a ch chance there. Um, I was really excited. And the first response I got was them telling me I was not even competitive enough to receive a secondary application. Whoa. And so right then and there, I almost was like, I don't, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Um, so that, that was hard, was reminding myself that I can do this. Um, but what I found to be really useful was I had good friends and I would have friends, they knew when I had my interviews and I would have them talk to me beforehand. And for me, when I was applying or even going to interview, it's hard to remember like, what have I done that's important or that matters? But if you ask your friends to be like, what have I done that's useful in medicine or in college? They have, they remember the things you do. They remember the late nights you went on and the way you care for people and the volunteer projects. And you're like, oh yeah, I guess I did a little something that was somewhat useful and helpful. And then that can, that for me helped, help me get through it. Friends and family. Wow. That's quite a story. That, that is impressive. Uh, yeah. Okay. What do you like best about Harvard Medical? Um, I think that's an easy one. It's the people. I definitely, when I was choosing my schools, um, I, I was shocked to get to Harvard, really, really shocked. Um, and when I went, I was, it's going to be pretentious and they're going to think all these, like, they're just going to think they're better than everybody else. And like I said, I'm from Florida, from a smaller town. Um, my parents didn't go to college. I don't have the nice, like, Ivy League pedigree that a lot of people have. Um, but I was shocked that people were, they were incredible and they were caring and I think what really struck me and drew me to Harvard was that I knew my classmates would push me to be better because we didn't all love like research or service or policy, but everyone loved something so, so different. And I was like, this is what I need. To have someone next to me who's going to be working in the Senate and someone next to me who's going to be working on nanotech and someone down the hall who's going to be working um, in clinical research. Like I needed to have that push. And also they were supportive. You wouldn't know that someone was a Fulbright Rhodes Scholar until like it came out one day in, in passing. What I did know is that they were caring, they were passionate, and they wanted to be really good at what they did. And that's the kind of energy I was excited to be a part of as a, as a member of the class. Great, that's fantastic. Okay, what could be improved at Harvard Medical? Yeah, so I actually, I put that in my secondary. It was, it was a bold line. I told them that I'm excited to come to Harvard. There are things I want to change and make better about the school. Um, and they somehow let me in. So coming to Harvard, I mean, there's a lot of things that can change. One thing is thinking about the socio and economic diversity of the patients. Um, Harvard is right next to Roxbury, which is a predominantly black and Hispanic area. And they don't serve most of those patients. They don't come to their hospitals. Um, they, um, they go to the, the Boston Medical Center. So Harvard has a problem with the patient they serve, the way they do outreach and the way that they talk to them. And even within faculty and students, I think there's lacking a lot of diversity in who's there. Um, but at the same time, what I knew in going there is that in me being here, it told, if that told one patient or one student or one doctor that you also belong here and can be in that space, that's powerful. Harvard has a lot of work to do to think about the way in which they impact the Boston community and the way in which they shape what leaders of the world look like and sound like. Um, and I hope they're on the way to, way, to, way to doing that. Okay, great. Now let's turn to the National Student Response Network. Very basic question about it. What is it? <laughs> Let's start with that. 
Gladly. So the National Student Response Network, it's a network of medical, nursing, and PA students that are around the U.S. in all 50 states. And it's, it's pretty simple. Our goal is to help out hospitals and nonprofits and governmental organizations with the things that are, that are ailing them, predominantly facing COVID-19. And so this, the simple idea was people need help and we have other students that want to help. Let's find a way to connect them. And what about all the, I mean, as I said at the very beginning of the show, there were so many people who said they had volunteer positions and they were canceled because of COVID-19. Yeah. So, and the, you know, the restrictions on, on uh, PP, uh, PPE and, and that kind of stuff. How are you dealing with those restrictions? Why are your volunteers being accepted and those essentially fired? So I think it's something that was, we were trying to do when, when we founded it. So thinking about somewhere like me, if let's add internship here in Pensacola in my hometown, which would have made a lot of sense to save money. Um, the hospital is suddenly saying, we don't have the same role for you. Something special about NSRN is we came and said, I know it's hard for you, maybe hard to imagine how students can work, but here are five or six or seven ways in which students have worked in the past at other places. Here's what it can look like at your institution. I think that made it powerful because then they didn't have to imagine we don't have masks, how do we work, work in students? Say, hey, students have been involved in doing telehealth work. They've been on the 211 hotlines. They've been on poison control hotlines. They've delivered PPE to people. they delivered food for the elderly. And you start to give ideas for them and they're suddenly like, wait, there are these niches in which students can work. And I think what's special is that we, is that we have those opportunities for people, um, especially with the current environment of, of, of America, with the protests that are, that are going on and the racism that's gripping our country, things are changing in terms of safety and where volunteers can go. But the fact that we also have remote tasks, I mean, that we have ability to say, if where you are is not safe or you don't feel safe, you can also do things remotely. And then people need help contact tracing. Just because like, you're sitting in North Carolina, you can be a contact tracer for someone in Seattle remotely or over the phone. And so that's kind of what, what's special about us. So you're basically doing, you're working to a certain extent remotely in whatever the institution says we need, we, we need you for, right? It varies. So it can it be remote or in person. Because it's like in New York, everything is remote because they didn't have PPE. In some places, they did a PPE for our volunteers. Also, there's like contactless testing centers through different groups that had, had PPE available for our volunteers to go work there and they just needed bodies. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we're, we're powerful because we're flexible and because we're free and can mobilize fast. I can't give you someone for 40 hours a week and say they'll be there every day from eight to five. But I can say my volunteer can be there tomorrow and they can work 15 hours a week and they're really passionate and energetic. And because they're medical and nursing and PA students, they've already done their background check, which in some ways also gives some manner of like security when people are looking to hire them. Or sorry, bring them on as volunteers. Okay, okay, great. How did you come up with this idea? <laughs> um, I think, it, so what happened was, I'm in medical school at Harvard, they announced things are virtual, and so I'm sent home to Florida. And mm -hmm. me being who I am, I wanna be doing everything and wanna be helpful. And it was hard, I was like, had I been in Boston, if I could have been at the Brigham Hospital doing mass, mass fit testing, could have been at Boston Hospital homeless doing temperature checks on, on their temporary clinics that they have there. I can think of all these things that I could have been doing. And now I'm like, I'm here and I can't do it. And also I realized it's like, I'm in my hometown that raised and supported me. And at the hospital down the street realized they needed someone to make, to help man the phones or help the scheduling. They have no way to know that I'm home and I'm help and I would love to help. And while I'm not a doctor, I'm not going to be intubating or writing orders. There are a lot of things I can do that are helpful and important. Then nobody knows that I exist. And that's kind of where we came from, was saying we have a need from local hospitals. We have students okay. that want to fill that need. All we need to do is find a way to connect them. And so that's what you're doing. Right. That's great. So, we, so that's, that's the way we work. And we have, we can walk through the structure later, but we have coordinators, both state and regional, to help to make that happen and keep people on track and keep finding more ways in which Hospitals have needs because hotspots pop up and they change sure. and they move, um, but they need to be addressed and supported. How many volunteers has NSRN placed or how many opportunities has it helped fill or is currently publicizing? It's a lot of questions there, actually. You can break it down. Yeah, so I'll break it down. So currently, I'll have to check our exact numbers. I think we currently have, I think, 230 opportunities. Wow. And those will range from we need one person to we need 48 people. So it can vary in size. Um, and of our 5,000 volunteers, so we have hundreds of them that are working right now. We've, we've already de deployed over time, there's some repeats, um, several thousand of them. Um, so and basically what that means, like we have volunteers that deploy, but also we still have, we still have space for people to, for, to receive tasks. 
it so depends on where you are. Some places there's less volunteers and more tasks, uh, some is other way around. Um, but we have, we have volunteers that are working and we have tasks that still need to be filled. Okay, let's say I'm a pre-med, pre-PA, pre-whatever, and, yeah. or just someone who wants to help out. Yeah. I know it's very much geared to students, but let's just say, let, let's leave it to the students, okay? How okay. would I go about using the NSRN? What, would, what, what should I do? So let's say you, like, you are, I'll start first with like, if you're an, uh, like I'm already, already in school, mm -hmm. uh, it's, you go on a website, which, which is nsrnhealth.org, and you say, I want to be a volunteer, and you sign up. Um, let's say that you are a student who's not currently accepted and you had an internship this summer or you want to do something because you think that when it comes time to apply to med school, you want to say what you did during COVID-19. Um, what I'll say is what we don't currently take those students as part of our network, but here's what, what I can say is that if you look on our website, we have regional coordinators. Sometimes if you reach out to them, they may know of opportunities that they, they, that they can suggest to you that are in your area. But more importantly, think about who's in your area. I'm sure if you call three or four hospitals, that someone has something for you. If you call the United Way, I'm sure they still are taking volunteers. If you call your local Red Cross, they're doing, um, they're still doing blood drives, but they need people to work as screeners. And also we have to your health department and see, do they need contact tracers? Contact tracers, they, a lot of places require you to be 18 and that's all, all that they require from you. Um, and then if you're confused about what is training like or how do I, <clears throat> sorry, how do I find those things? Um, Johns Hopkins University has an open course to be trained as a contact tracer. Partners in Health in Maryland, uh, I mean in uh, Massachusetts, has a program to be a contact tracer. And so I'd say start with that. Start local. See what's happening around you. Contact some named organizations that you know working, working in your area. Just, just be persistent. If you want to get involved and help out with COVID-19 response, it may take you some time to find people because they're busy and they're tired and they're overworked, but it's something that you can do and should do. Okay, now just to clarify something. So do you have to be in medical school or in a PA program to, to benefit from NSRN? Or do you just have to be in college to benefit from NSRN? From NSRN, you need to be enrolled in medical, nursing, or PA school. Got it. Okay, that's fine. But I think your suggestions are excellent for those who are a little bit before. Do you have any plans to, to expand it to the, pre, to, to the undergraduate population or no? So that's what we've been figuring out. So right, so I'll say two things. Right now we have some partners that work really well with undergraduates. So a, a partner we have that we're work, work, working with is called Med Supply Drive. And they, they're they working all over the US. I know they take under, undergraduates. Um, I'll say for us right now, that's not what, what, what the plan is. Come mm -hmm. this fall when things change and everyone's online and the wave is worse, we then may have things separate where we have both opportunities for like current health freshman students and also for non-health freshman students. Got it. Okay. Well, right now we don't. All right. Now, another, another turning back to you a little bit more. How do you uh, manage the time demands of medical school and running the NSRN? I realize you're home now, but you still have remote classes, don't you? Yes, I've got remote classes and I have research that's being done remotely. Um, I think I'll say it's, it's two things. One is I really care about this. NSRN works a lot with health equity, working with underserved populations in community hospitals and native health groups. I got into medicine through health equity work. My goal of getting into medicine was thinking about who doesn't have access to medicine, who doesn't have access to care, who may look like me or sound like me or be from a community like mine or from one that's very different and how to, how to help get them, get them that care. And so NSRN is just another way that I can do that kind of outreach work and that recharges me. I care a lot more about the kidney when I'm doing things outside of the classroom that make me excited and passionate, make me want to be a better doctor because I can see who it can help. Also having a team, so like NSRN, so I'm the national director and founder, but just three other members who are on our executive team. And so we work together to share responsibility. I also built out an administrative team. So we have a PA coordinator, a nursing coordinator, and we have um, three national strategy coordinators to help make things happen. And then from that, I have, we have a structure. So we have mm -hmm. eight regional coordinators, and then we have coordinators in all 50 states. And I think that was something that was tricky for me to learn because you don't learn anywhere along the path of medicine how to be a leader and work within systems and everything like that. Um, so it's been an adjustment and a, and a learning curve, but it's also, it makes sense because there, I'm in Florida. I don't know what's happening in North, North Dakota. I don't know where North, where North Dakota is set up. It'd be rude for me to say that I do know, but I can ask my North, I mean, North Dakota coordinator, Heather and Carissa, what's happening there, what's going on, what do you need? And the health departments are far happier to respond to someone who's from there and knows it than somewhere far away. And so it just becomes a matter of me helping organize 
and coordinate people. And so we use Slack. And then every Sunday we have a Zoom call where we all chat together with all the state emergency coordinators about what's happening, what are best practices, what are next steps, and how do we move forward together. I was very impressed with the organizational structure when I looked at it on the site. I mean, again, you've only put it together in two or three months at this point, right? A little yeah. over two months. So it, was, it was a learning curve and it was interesting, but it, it's been amazing because in medicine, we're all about teams and structures. Everything you do will have a team of nursing and PAs and OT therapists and pharmacists, as well as like your attendings and their chiefs. And so learning how to work with some structure is tricky. And I've made mistakes. I'm making mistakes. I've also found successes. And that's part of the journey of medicine. It's part of the journey of life. Uh, yeah. Now, whether you're looking at either uh, students in med school, PA school, nursing school, or pre those schools, how do you advise applicants to use volunteer experiences, not only to help the communities they're serving, but also to test their interest in specific subspecialties or professions in general, especially for the, the pre-healthcare group? I, once they're in healthcare school, whether it's whatever variety it is, they have some direction, but they're still going to probably be narrowing their path. Before that, they might be deciding which path to choose. Um, so how do you advise them to use that experience? So what I would say this for me is something that you have to do. Because when you're taking organic chemistry and biochem and cell bio and genetics, <clears throat> it's easy to get all bogged down and being like, this is hard. And I mean, you may love it. It also is hard and challenging. For me, I found that taking like one hour a week or four hours a week to do some service, which I'm sure you guys can find one hour, you all can find one hour a week, helps to recharge me because I see this is exciting. And I had to learn and see like, what is the way of engaging service that feels right to me? And that kind of told me within medicine, I spent time working with kids who have cancer and, and the service rewards and being like, does that engage me? Because it doesn't make me a bad person if I realize I can't do kids or I can't do cancer or I spent time working as a marketing counselor doing um, people who are experiencing substance use disorder. I love that work. I love people that I was working with. I learned through that. I'm not an infectious disease doctor. It's not what I was meant to do. And that's okay. I think there's nothing wrong with doing that. That teach me a whole lot about how to deal with people. 100%. Did I really love my experience? 100%. And so I encourage you to Take, and I didn't know when I tried it, what, if I was gonna like it. I had a friend who volunteered there. Um, it, it, they volunteered through the organization where it was a soup kitchen and they mentioned they had this arm to it. And so I'd say, if you're looking for things to do, look within existing organizations because <clears throat> they often have arms that are health related in some way, shape or form. And you'll find that these things engage you. And they make, they, for me, doing service work made me wanna be a better provider. And it made me wanna be a provider so I could serve those communities. And I think that makes your story more compelling when you're applying. More importantly, it makes you feel fulfilled because I love my research, but it's hard every day trying to cure cancer on a molecular level. Going out and doing work and I would, that would do on two nights a week when I would go do it, it was nice because if nothing else that day, I'm like, I didn't cure lung cancer, but I made sure that people were happier, that they had some supplies they needed and they left that day safer than had I not been there. And for me, that helps fulfill me. That's wonderful. It's a great answer. Thank you. How do you see your career evolving? Do you see yourself going for an MPH or an MPA or an MBA? Are there any specialties? Well, clearly there are some specialties that attract you. So what are they? How do you see, how do you see in your, what's in your crystal ball for you? <laughs> if I knew exactly, it'd be, it'd be wonderful. I think <laughs> I have some ideas. And I think what's healthy is that it's shifted. Like if you talk to my friends over this year, I came in saying, I will get my MPH while I'm in med school. And then I was going through, I was like, actually my passion is like, Think about health equity and health access and who has access to care and to medicine and change the hospital system. So I'm like, I need an MBA. And then I was like, mm, maybe I also want to decide to cure cancer. So I need uh, a, an MD PhD. So if you ask, I can't say I know what my career will hold. I can tell you it'll hold a dual degree. Because for me, medicine is what I love, but I need to be doing something else. I need to be curing the disease or change access to a hospital or change how we think about healthcare. What I'm still learning is I'm like, what parts of those fulfill me and make me excited. So I know whatever I'm doing, I'm gonna work very hard at it. And so I wanna see what also, um, what, what, what not only excites me, but also am I good at, and I leave it feeling ch charged for the next day. So I can't say I know yet. Um, okay. In terms of specialties, I think it'll likely be surgery. I spent in time everything from ID to surgery to cardiology to a variety of things. Um, and for me, I know I'm a very practical person. 
there's something special about surgery of walking in a room and doing something and saying, I can quantify some way in which someone is better from me having walked in here. Um, but I think primary care is powerful and important. With me, it's, it's also more challenging thinking about if I see someone for 10 years, how do I see the way that social determinants of health affect them and that the way that stressors affect them? And so it's seeing what works for me. I think it's surgery, but we'll see what happens in a few years. Okay. And is there anything you would have liked me to ask you in this interview? Um, I think the only thing that, that, that I wish I could make sure people know is that find the things that you're, you're passionate about and pursue them, even if it doesn't seem like it follows the straight and narrow. So for me in undergrad, that meant that I was president of our hiking and our outdoors clubs and doing biomedical research. And people were you like, also leading camping backpacking trips? If I, yeah. I saw something, yeah. Yeah, so I led backpacking trips around, around the US. And so, because that made me happy and I, was, and, I, and I enjoyed it. And people were like, you should be like running the pre-med club at your school and you should be doing these things. And I was like, these things make me happy is something that I can be a leader in. And when I interviewed people were like, so you led backpacking trips and did biomedical research and you did th and you like did service work kind of in di different countries and I was like yeah it's what made sense to me and people found it engaging because it wasn't they knew I wasn't doing it to check a box they were doing, I was doing it because I cared about it and that'll come through and then when you get further in your career it can seem like things don't fit like I know health equity is a part of the work that I do I also know that I may end up being a surgeon and if, if those things don't seem like they align but they can if they align for you you just have to find a way to make that work. And so for me, that in some ways working on like disparity access work and seeing who, who has access to care and seeing how always people get into the hospital or what post-operative outcomes are maybe, um, it, it can change and you can be the one person who melds together pharmacodynamics and also with policy or also with international work. Um, and so if you have passion, put them together because that'll excite you and it's tricky, um, but it makes you interesting. I'm going to wait a minute because there's a garbage truck outside my window. <laughs> okay. So we're just going to pause. Tell me when you don't hear it anymore. You still hear it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to wait another minute. I'm sorry. No, it's no problem. Certain things I can't control. I don't have a sound studio. <laughs> it's part of the zoom, zooming and interviewing everything else. At home. Right. Right. And I forgot to close my window, which would not have blocked it, but uh, it would have been better. I think now, now we're clear. Now? Okay. That was a fantastic answer. And by the way, it jives very much, not only with what I've heard from successful med students that I've interviewed previously, but with what I hear from admissions directors. They don't want people who are just checking the box. And it really is pretty obvious when people are just checking the box. They want people who have, who have passions, have interests, and act on those interests. So then, I mean, the, the thing that I said, the things that keep you busy are things that make you exciting. So when it came time to interviews, preparing for questions wasn't as hard for me because I was like, I know what I, what I like to do. I know why it makes sense. And these are what I'm passionate about. They made it always mesh together. And people see that. It's easy for my face to light up when I talk about when I finally found a lab I liked after trying other ones. Or when I found, talk about why I love health equity and why I love access to care and why I love the outdoors. They were like, yeah, I can see it. It's not contrived. It's not scripted um, because I'm smiling and I'm laughing and it's, it's genuine. That's true. And the other thing that they're all also looking for is authenticity. So if you're authentically doing what you love, it's easy to be enthusiastic about it. Right. It's just, uh, just, just much easier. Janlyn, I think we're just about out of time. I want to thank you so much for sharing your amazing story and being so generous with your time, which obviously you have lots of things to do. You're one busy man. Where can listeners learn more about the National Student Resource Network? So if you're looking to learn more about the National Student Response Network. Sorry, Response visit, Network, my error. No problem. You can visit our website at nsrnhealth.org. And you can see there what volunteers are doing, who the coordinators are in your area. Um, and if you're a, and you'll find some ways, ways to get involved and ways to get inspired. And if people need help, it's also a way they can, they can request tasks. Um, so, and I just say, like, thank you all for listening. And keep seeing what excites you and go for that, even if it doesn't align with what medicine should be. If you're in medicine and you love that, you become what medicine is. You create medicine. Exactly. And always like, just go for it because what I was telling myself and I was applying is I was like, someone has to get this thing. Someone has to get into these schools. Someone has to be in this place. It might as well be me. 
Jalen, thank you so much again. We're going to link to the NSRN as well as to other resources related to this podcast from accepted.com slash 370. That's accepted.com slash 370. Listener, thank you too for joining Jalen Benson and me for Admission Straight Talk 370th episode. I have a final reminder and a favor to ask. First a reminder, don't miss the Med School Admissions Quiz. Find out if you are really ready to apply and competitive at your target schools. Take the quiz at accepted.com slash 370 quiz today. And the favor, if you find the show worthwhile, please tell a friend about Admissions Trade Talk. They'll thank you, and so do I. Thanks again for coming. This is Admissions Trade Talk produced by Accepted, and I am your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. <music>